Hello, and welcome back once again to Lost in Criterion. If you're still with us after last week's episode, <laughs> God bless you. Audience of uh, five. Yes. I will, I will point out that for a moment, I was hesitant to watch another Criterion movie after watching Sallow last time around, but we pressed on. And I'm glad we did, because I really like the movie we're talking about this week, which is the 1964 neo-noir even though noir, and it's described as a neo noir, even though noir, in my mind, still existed in '64, but I guess it really ended in like the early '50s. Written and directed by Samuel Fuller, American, uh, so no, no reading this time around. Uh. <laughs> and and incidentally, I, I did mention this at the end of the last episode. Uh, Sam Fuller would be a hundred this year if he were still alive, and his birthday happens to coincide with the week we watched this. Um, though when you're listening to it, obviously. That who knows? doesn't, yeah. Who knows? Because um, these are going on the internet at some indiscriminate time after we after we record it, uh, in indeterminable, I suppose is what I meant to say. Um, and and you know, once they're online, they exist forever because that's how the internet works. So you could be listening to this in the year twenty five twenty five if man is still alive. Yeah, if do woman tell. has survived. Is man still alive? Yeah. Uh, send us a note. An email uh, <laughs> right. with your comments. We'd be happy to know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So should I introduce myself? Did you introduce yourself? I am, as always, the Adam Glass, and this is my great friend and mentor. <laughs> John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. <laughs> when did I become your mentor? I don't know. By the way, how do you pronounce mentor? Is it mentor I... or is it mentor? Listen, I say mentor. Okay, but, I'm, uh, I'm just really curious, because I'm always unsure, because Mentor sounds like it ought to be a comic book uh, villain. <laughs> mentor, the mental. Right, right? Like, shouldn't More. he be on the moon or something? Maybe have a <laughs> should... Well, I mean, it needs, to, it needs to be very alliterative. Um, speaking of things like that, this movie <laughs> is a thousand percent pulp. Oh, yeah, and I love it. <laughs> and I, I love it so much. This one, yeah, and the next film we're also going to watch is same same director, same everything, basically. This this film, I loved it. Now, it wouldn't necessarily call it a good film per se. No, but it is wonderful. It it takes pulp to levels unseen by man. Because it it exists, it's it's a pre credit sequence. Uh, makes it makes it so much better. But this is probably I I'll go on record. I'll say it. This is the most memorable opening scene in any movie I have ever seen. Just it wow. it was so great. It made me fall in love with the movie immediately. <laughs> um, because it is it is a first person when we first get it. It is a first person shot of our main character. Um, Beating a man with her purse, and because it's first person from his point of view, it is. It is. We start with an angry woman beating the camera and yelling at it, and it was yeah. And it's, it's a great such scene. a great yeah, scene. No, it's it's so great, and and it's very. It's almost disoriented. It, no, it really is because you have no context for what's going on. It's just it's there, it's beautiful. and it's beautiful, and that's. What, yes. Yeah. No. Um, it is a beautiful. We get the wig torn off. She's bald. We don't know what's going on. She beats him. Then she. T- why is she bald? Why is she angry? Why is she yes, hitting me? She, why is her picture hanging on the bookcase in the back with a whole bunch of other pictures? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And and she beats him. She takes out his wallet. Makes a point to say there's three hundred dollars here, but I'm only taking seventy five of them because that's what's owed to me. Uh, she sprays him with seltzer water. <laughs> Then she fixes her makeup, puts on her wig, the yeah, opening credits yeah. start, and she walks away. And we next see her two years later. And it's... it's. And you know, it makes us no, love her. I absolutely love her. Right from the absolutely beginning. love this character right from the start. And it's meant to be. Um, one thing I really love about this movie, Fuller uses a lot of actors who weren't used in anything else. Um, obviously, our, our main character, Kelly, um, is, is also in Shock Corridor, which he made the year prior to this. Um, but uh, but other than that, not a lot of people in a lot of things. 
What's her name? I forget the actress. Oh, I can't name. remember. Some, uh, Constance. Something Towers? Constance something like Powers or Towers, I think, is the name. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, I, well I, when I read those credits, man, I thought this is the greatest yeah. stage name. <laughs> yes, it's ever. a great name for her character too. I think it's Constance. Towers. I think it really is. Yeah, it's it's the greatest stage name I've ever read, and I, it made me fall in love because even the actress is kind of pulpy. Yeah. Her name is pulpy, yeah. and she's. It's like he went out and found somebody with a name that is pulpy, just so that he could have that name be in the credit sequence. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. It, it sounds crazy, but I, it, it's, yeah. I, I fell in love with the actress. Because you know, she's me. she's done some minor work um, throughout, and and all kind of kind of pulpy too. I mean, her most recent credits are. Uh, oh, she's she's still working today. She's on General Hospital right now. There um, you go. And that it hard to get pulpier. It is hard to get pulpier than than American, uh, unless you're Sam Fuller. Unless you're Sam Fuller, then it's easy <laughs> to get pulpier. Than he that. could do it. He could do it no matter what. Um, anyway, uh, she, especially in this movie, it's uh, one of the one of my favorite things about this movie is that if this were if this were married ten years or twenty years earlier, um, that character could have existed just as well, played by like Joan Crawford and Crawford or Barbara Stanwyck. Um, who are A-list actors who she really channels really well in this. And the dialogue le- in this movie le- leaves a little to be desired. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, but that, that feeds into the point. But yeah, it's, it's dime store novel dialogue. This is, oh, people don't, yeah. people well, it's don't a, it's talk. A, it's a dime store novel yeah. story, and it's got dime store novel dialogue. Yeah. But, but there's nothing wrong not, with that. The actors do a good job of delivering yeah, the, the actor. Dialogue. She, that's what I'm saying. She's a great actor, and I think you know, despite despite her being B list, um, she's she's on in, at least in this movie, she does just as well as as any any noir A listers could have done. I think, and she is yeah. she is great in this movie. I I actually. Uh, we'll get into this obviously with the next episode a little more. I liked her less in Shock Corridor, but but I still. Well, but I, yeah, yeah. we'll get into this with Shock Corridor. I also agree, but I have a very weird reason <laughs> for why. So. Uh, speaking of Shock Corridor, a little a little uh, patting himself on the back uh, moment, uh, blinking you missed it as she's arriving in the town of Grantville, where all of our uh, all of our action takes place for the mo- for the most part in the rest of the movie um she pa- we we get a pan across a movie theater showing shock corridor uh, oh really i totally yes, missed which, that which i think is it's such such a perfect moment for the whole poppiness of sam fuller that that happens <laughs> no yeah i i really do love this director yeah. because of what he does he's shameless yeah. i heard and it's beautiful i read one one uh, review of this movie uh, complaining I don't know necessarily complaining but uh, saying that Sam Fuller never gets the respect in America because he was so pulpy but he is, he so epitomizes America that he's big in in international markets in the same way I can see in the that. same way I can see that because and and the direct and the guy who wrote this used this disparagingly but in the same way that uh, um What's his face? Comedian uh, is big in France. Uh, oh, Jerry, Jerry Lewis. Lewis. Yes, um, and he's he, the, okay, the director. The director yeah. said, or the, not the director. The guy who wrote the article said that this makes up for their love of Jerry Lewis. But at the same time, Jerry Lewis is loved in France for the same reason that Sam Fuller is loved everywhere else. He so epitomizes American culture at the time. Right. He's uh, kind of he is on the level with somebody like for me like John Wayne. Yeah, or he something. is quintessentially. He represents. A, element of america that they assume exists yeah, yeah that is believed to exist and therefore this is like the perfect model yeah of that. i mean there's a reason why i know some japanese guys who totally sound like john of course Wayne. that's that's a very stereotypical <laughs> japanese english to, well actually it's pretty rare but i know a couple guys who really love western movies yeah. and kind of you know hone their english watching oh, western yeah. movies uh-huh. and so they have a certain draw to the way they talk and 
makes him sound like John well, Wayne. Well, that's, and yeah, that's, that's actually, you know, watching pulp like that, pulp westerns, pulp movies like this, is a great way to learn English because all of the language is pretty straightforward and, and kind right, of jilted. Right, It's very simple. You learn some slang, but you learn it in a context where it's very <laughs> obvious what yes. it means. Yes, Yeah, no, it... I, it, and the, this is a great movie, and I understand 100% why on, in international markets yeah. people would say, look, it's America. Yeah. Continuing my love of this character, uh, as she gets off the bus in Grantville, uh, one of her first lines uh, is, 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 we get this very seductive pan of her body, um, uh, and, and as, as Griff, our, our honorable but tough uh, at least that's how he's introduced. <laughs> that that kind of falls apart real quick. But uh, yeah, honorable but, but but tough local sheriff uh, sees her get off the bus, and every all the guys are checking her out. And her first line is, "Please check my trunk." Hacha cha cha cha. Yeah. Well, you know that it's from a from a totally un, a totally unrelated perspective. That's actually one of the shots that I found really disappointing. Yeah. And I'm going to explain why here because like throughout the film they do a pretty good job of lighting her and using the right kind of filter yeah because you know especially when you're dealing with black and white cinema it's all about the lens filters and stuff to make people look attractive because black and white's not oh yeah for and 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 fuller okay? fuller is an expert on that sort of lighting yeah and they're all very good for most of the film 99 yeah. percent of the film she comes off as very beautiful but somehow like he forgot the filter <laughs> just, or something yeah and so we pan our we pan up and we hit her face and it looks like she's twenty years older than the like the last time we saw her. Yeah. Yeah. Because we see her doing her makeup and they've got that soft filter on it and she looks very, very beautiful. But then they pan up and it's like Bride of Frankenstein or something. It was like, Whoa, yeah. what happened here? Yeah, one so, one thing one thing I'm I'd never seen a Fuller movie. I had I had no idea really who he was before I watched this. But one thing one thing about that is his with cinematography, I really feel uh, that his cinematographer, at least, and and you know, choosing good people to work with is just as it's just as important as, as being able to do it yourself, knowing knowing who's good. Um, but it's really there's a lot of this on par with uh, on par with uh, like Hitchcock's use of light and, and oh yeah oh no, yeah like yeah. he his his shots are. By far beautiful. Yeah, but except for that's one shot, I was like, "What?" <laughs> it was like a what? What? what, what, what? <laughs> yes, because like she looked totally different than she did five minutes before. Yeah, and I and that's the only time we see her like that for the most part. The rest of the time, she's got the nice filters on and the makeup's well done, and so she looks kind of like this pulpy, beautiful dame. Yes, but in that one scene, I'm like, "Oh my god." So that's just a side note. Yeah. So so I hate to I hate to keep bringing back <laughs> bringing up Salo again, but but it no, God, it seems no. it seems inevitable that cause the way we do this, we will compare every film well the to way this, we do this to... the way we do this it seems there's there's kind of an underlying current in each of the sets of films that we watch, um, mm-hmm. and and this is this is also very we should point out to the audience that we tend to watch the yeah same we usually sets, we usually two or three films at a time yeah and then and then discuss them all all at once because of how our it's very hard it's very hard to get a phone call into japan um the the window is very small no it's rain (laughs) kill it if you must (laughs) we gotta call radar (laughs) in korea yes it's it's it's, he patches us he patches it through um (laughs) they've got a they've got a half of our conversation is yelled uh over the sea of japan uh, by men with megaphones (laughs) it's it's terrible um it's a wonder that this sounds yeah. as good as it does. Yeah, has. I mean, if this is if there's ever any any problems with the audio, uh, you can blame those that that guys yelling that Chinese guy people. yelling at the at the Japanese man. Uh, there's a language barrier there too. It's uh, yeah, well, they're using phonetic alphabet. Well, yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> semaphore flags. I it's think they might yeah, actually. It's all semaphore. Use. Yeah, it's all semaphore. Hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> Anyway, uh, this movie and and it only sounds like it's real time. This movie also has has a lot of sort of anti uh, anti establishment. But this movie this movie is a lot more about hypocrisy um, than than anything, and and that just that helps <laughs> sell it even more. Um, oh yeah, well 
yeah, this film does have some. Yeah, it has some definite like points. Yeah, but mainly it's just a fun. Yeah, it's a fun. Like, it's I mean, a fun like, pulpy movie, but it's actually trying to say, uh, say something. Uh, yeah, and it's it not is. trying to say something that we don't. You know, that's not obvious to anyone who has ever lived in society. Um, so, but just on a on a side note, yeah, Criterion Collection, all about pedophilia? Um, question mark. <laughs> Not all about pedophilia. Um, 60%? To be fair, um, <laughs> Salo was more about pederists than pedophiles. Um, okay. You're right. Though there, there were certainly plenty of allusions to pedophiles in that movie, too. Um, but, ah. Uh, Sorry, moving on. Sorry, I just think that was a funny... For me, that was kind of a really weird yeah. well, thing well, you've turn blown, for the film to take. You've blown, you've blown the film's twist ending, so thank you. Well, not it's not oh, even like the well, ending. I'm so it's sorry, not the audience. No, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's actually not the twist. It, yeah, it, it's, it's the end of the second act. It's a surprising it's, thing. It's the climax. Yeah, it's the climax. But it's not yeah. the actual. Yeah, it's not a twist in any. Film. Well, I mean, it's yeah. it's a twist in. A, it is in because you, twist, you have no idea that he is that until. I mean, well, that's the thing. That's the weird thing is it felt like a very like M Night Shyamalan sort yeah. of thing where it's like, here's something that there's no way you could have figured out. I made until we told you or something. I'll tell like you that. what though, if you rewatch this movie, because I made the mistake of, I made the mistake of uh, reading about this movie before I watched it, so I knew okay. I did not. I watch knew it. Or, I mean, what I did not read about it. I knew what was up with Grant, who is who is the main love interest in the movie. Um, I knew what oh, was so up that's with a Grant, shame. and it was it's much more interesting if you don't know. That yeah, topic. I was. It was a mistake for me to have done so. So, uh, if you haven't so watched it yet, if you haven't watched it yet, own? stop this uh, and and watch it because it does kind of it but does it's too it doesn't late, ruin things. Talk about pedophiles. It doesn't ruin things, but but it does. There is there is enough sort of, and it's not even necessarily that there's foreshadowing. But it makes, you know, just, it's, everything that we were supposed to be horrified by when we find out what he is, you know, the fact that he funds this children's hospital, um, the, the fact that he's, his niece Buffy is, is the one in this situation. Though not necessarily actually his niece, I guess, because everybody calls him Uncle Grant and, and Uncle Griff yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but. Bunny, not Buffy. Well, I think we're supposed to be horrified by the fact that he has established himself in this position in, yeah. this, in yeah. the society. And knowing knowing what he is going in as we get all of that establishment of what he is just makes it, oh, so, so shiver-inducing. <laughs> just... I kind of need to rewatch this film then. No, I think... Because I hadn't really thought about the fact... Because, like, it does, like... If you don't know, it does come totally out of left yeah, field. Yeah, because, because... For me, at least, it did. Like, we get we get the lines before he's introduced about, oh, he's so great, this hospital is open to all children, no matter race or religion or creed. Um, and, and it's just, oh, he likes yeah, everybody, yeah. and that's, oh... Oh, that's sick. <laughs> but it's kind of funny that way. No, though, I no, think. It like, is. It's, it's not. It's not solo because we don't see anything. <laughs> right. It's just creepy to think. And about. even when he, even when he gets caught uh, in in the middle of of doing things, um, we still get we get Kelly's point of view, which is just shock. So we don't even necessarily know what's going on until, you know, like three scenes later when she's trying to explain why she killed him. All we see is Bunny yeah. running out of the room. And Bunny... Well, yeah. I picked up on Well, I mean, it's, I it's, that, it's I, very I easy to pick up on what's on. going on. It is not hard to pick up on what's going yeah, on. Yeah. But it's still not explicitly stated or shown. Well, and even then, in the... the... They don't dance around the issue as much as they could, but yeah. they do sort of dance around the well, issue yeah. a little bit. Yeah, even in the police station. Which, speaking of which, police. What's the, what's the? I forget the police officer's Griff. name. Griff is his name. Griff. Grant and Griff, Griff are our two main jerk? main characters. Griff, kind of a jerk. Um, Griff, I don't like Griff. Griff, uh, I don't think we're supposed to like Griff. Griff, you know. Okay. Griff. I wasn't a hundred percent sure because you know, considering the fact that we're watching this film in a different time and yeah. a different context, I wasn't sure if we're supposed to find. Well, he's very. He's Griff very an acceptable character. He's very hard boiled, but at the same time, he's not very accepting. Uh, Grant, Grant, obviously. 
um, if, if this if this movie is anti-establishment, Grant is this old money. Look at me, I'm rich and so, yeah, so great. Yeah, I kind of hated Grant. And, and yeah, we are we already hate Grant. Even even before we know anything about Grant, he's already. Oh, I just got back from Europe. Here are all my presents. Let's look at oh, my yeah. movies. Total. Yeah. Yeah, he's just, he's yeah, very. You find yourself like he, hating. Yeah, You're he like, like man, Grant. He's flaunting everything, and and you should love me because I'm rich, sort of thing. And and you know, in retrospect, watching the movie, knowing what Grant is, this sort of trying to buy acceptance for himself. Is is also really it's really great. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I think this film is, might actually be better on the second one. Yeah, I really because you also get that. Like, yeah, he's not just buying acceptance; he's also buying himself a shield. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He's protecting him. Absolutely, he's and that's building up this credibility where no one would ever suspect yeah. him of something. Which is which is really one of one of my few problems with this movie is how accepting everyone is of it at the end. That that she the former prostitute claims it's happening, and everyone says, "Oh, you're lying. That's not true." And then they find the girl, and she's immediately hailed as a hero. And it's it's a very it's so sudden, such a sudden well, thing. Yeah, but Kelly, the character, even comments on like, "You guys are quick to raise statues." Oh yeah, you. yeah, no, exactly. It's kind no, of she, she, she comments she kind on of it. lets the audience in on the fact that like, yeah, okay, we need to wrap this film up. <laughs> No, I guess. We I don't guess. have half an hour for development of why they love Kelly now. Yeah. So, bam. But they all love Kelly. There's honestly, there's a lot more... Within the world of Grantville, uh, there is a lot more implications for, for Grant being... Beca- uh, I mean, his, his family is the biggest, richest family in the community. They own everything, including the they name of the movie and the name of the town. Is it, it is, They founded it. They are it. And he is... He's the only one in the family we see existing. So as far as we know, his parents are even dead. He is the epitome of this town. Yeah. And and he's a child molesting uh, rich guy. Um but but while it's very explicit why Grant is hypocritical and why everyone's love of Grant is hypocritical because he's so bad, I think it's a little more subtle with Griff. Griff is is the sheriff. He is the one upholding the law. But when he meets, he's, he sees a woman get off a bus, and he knows, by the way, she talks. She, knows, she yeah. He knows she's a prostitute. I mean, she's selling champagne for $10 a bottle, um, and he's surprised at how cheap it is. And she said, oh, there's a discount for the first fella or something like that. You know, it's all, it's all, it's, it's hedged in noirish uh, dime store novel uh, flirtation. But he knows he knows what's going on. He he spots her, and just as okay. just as easily as she spots him, because she's the one who says, "So how long have you been a cop?" And he's surprised. Um, but but the fact that you know he's he's the police officer in this town, uh, goes home, has sex with her, pays her for the champagne. Uh, you know he is he is cre- he is not doing this. Uh, there's through the rest of the movie, we have this subtle sort of oh maybe he's actually in love with her sort of thing. But at the same time, in that first interaction, he is using her services as a prostitute. Um, oh, yeah. And then he kicks is, her out of town. Well, and we do understand from the beginning that he's not a good person. Yeah, exactly. He's not a good police officer. Yeah. I think we're supposed to take him as sort of a pulpy, sort of... Yeah. He's like... Rough a, and tumble, yeah. like, detective kind of thing. But he really does, at least to a modern audience, just come off yeah, he is, he is a lot of police moral, officer. He has a lot of moral issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. He, I wondered about that a few times throughout the film because we also, do we, maybe I'm, I may have zoned out, so I'm going to actually ask a question. Okay. Do we get any explanation about Griff's past? We know he went to Korea, right? We know that Grant saved his life in Korea. Right. Um, but we don't have any explanation for why Griff is so hard boiled. No. Right? Oh other and other that, than I the fact that... other than the fact that he is the main police figure in a noir movie. We have no reason okay, for him yeah. being. Okay, I understand. He <laughs> must be hard boiled. Yeah. But like we don't get any backstory for him, so it really makes that the, that scene where he just automatically can spot a prostitute from like a mile away. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's more absurd. It's an informed and ability. hard to deal with. It's an informed ability because he's he's such a great police officer. Yeah, That's, and, and it bothers me because yeah. yeah, and well, I'm also a little bit bothered that Grant though has like a whorehouse just on the outside of town. Yeah, across, it has almost as hey, many girls in it as there are people in town. <laughs> it's across the river, thank you, and in another oh, state. 
Um, yeah, it doesn't change the fact that, like, it doesn't really line up with the population of the town. Yeah, we, well, Grantville itself, we, it's very weird, because the, the main drag that the bus goes down on its way into town and its way out of town at the end is very, it's like row houses. They're, they're right next to each other, and it's, 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 uh, they're walk-ups, and it's like Brooklyn. Yeah, but, but it's the, also supposed to be middle. But of the nowhere, rest so is this middle of nowhere small town. Away. Why? Why is there? Yeah, why is it so, so densely populated downtown? I have I have lived in the Midwest <laughs> and on the East Coast, and I have and and even out west, it, even more spread out. Um, and and yeah, the houses have no reason to be that close, even in well, downtown. Out there, there be there be monsters, Adam. Yeah, that's what you're not getting. <laughs> There's see. a little little bubble around that well no it's really like grantville is a very unbelievable place in general because yeah. yeah we even get like on the bench we get this like very like parkish like yeah scene but yeah we got the row houses for no reason and then we've got this whorehouse on the other side of the river so i'm forced to assume that like maybe grantville is like a suburb of some other larger city or something that could support a 20 man brothel or 20 person brothel <laughs> maybe well it's like that's like city material I well think, since, since it's weird it's since she's weird. across the river since she's across the river uh and suggesting that it's outside of town it might be there's enough small towns in the area that that she can she can exist but yeah, in any maybe. case like the dialogue in this movie grant and grant and grantville is a place that only exists in the pages of a time store novel. Yeah, and it makes it great. No, it, it does. I'm not yeah. complaining per se. It's just there's sometimes the pulpiness gets enough that I'm like, oh, I can't. I don't know if I can. Ex- I don't know if I can play along with this. Yeah, and Grantville itself was one of those situations where I was like, this is really confusing. Yeah. Because, like, you, the whole idea behind those pulp towns and stuff is supposed to be something that the audience can relate to. Like, to, to create an environment where these things could happen, but also the audience can relate to it. And most of the audience comes from, like, a Midwestern town. Or comes from, like, downtown, you know, Brooklyn. And so you have to create this melding of the two to get both audiences, right? Well, Granville's the same way, but when you see it actually pictured on TV... It starts getting harder to deal with. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So. No, no. It's it's true. It's true. Um, I think one of my one of my small issues with the movie, which obviously within the realm of the movie, in the same way, within the realm of the movie, it works very well. But within the reality, and maybe I'm just being very uh, very prejudiced in this. But the fact that our hooker with the heart of gold quotes uh, Gauthier, <laughs> Gauthier, and uh, and loves Moonlight Senata and Beethoven and and wants to go to wants to go to uh, Venice for like legitimate I love not, it. legitimate <laughs> reasons not be, because she loves and she wants to see where her favorite poems were written not because oh it's 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 Italy it's so it's romantic or romantic whatever. or whatever yeah uh, she's very she's very well learned in this movie yeah, unrealistically and, and, well learned i think well we don't know her past so maybe but, yeah. she's a university dropout or something we don't know um I, <laughs> I love the small jokes of this movie too like when when she's introducing herself to grant at the party and griff says and everyone calls her kelly k e w l y quoting the stupid irish song <laughs> <laughs> that they use in uh, what's that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio? Uh, Catch me if you can. It's the only oh, yeah, sign yeah. of that movie because of the scenes of uh, them singing it on Lawrence Welk. K e double l y. But yeah, it's it's there's so much to love about this movie. And no, yeah, like really honestly, like it's not gonna make it into my top ten favorite movies. No, but if I ever want to show somebody what pulp is, yeah. No, we've this got is, our film right. This is here. a quintessential definition of pulp well, movie. And it's weird. Like I think I was telling you this before we started recording. It, this I love pulp. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, pulp art, pulp films, pulp books. Not quite as much, but yeah, whatever. Well, yeah. Um, it. This is. This was just heaven for me. I enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, and then, like really, when I compare it to something that's supposed to be a sort of homage to pulp like some more modern films who shall remain nameless oh let's name them pulp fiction (laughs) pulp fiction but there are some other ones too like well actually basically everything quentin tarantino makes but like 
these homages to pulp, I found that like the actual honest to god pulp film is way more enjoyable than the homages to it. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess makes sense, but I never thought about it before. Because you don't find many occasions to watch pulp film in daily life in America, honestly. Yeah. Because as I think your website reviewer guy talked about, it it's really downplayed in the United States yeah. compared to how popular it is overseas as because, a portrayal the, of America. Yeah, exactly. Which is weird because other things that are quintessentially American are just as popular. Like 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 John Wayne Westerns. They're, yeah, right. Super popular. Well, yeah. had their heyday. They're not there quite there well, anymore. Yeah, but, but they're, yeah. They're, but they are still quintessential to an era. And if we think about right. that, we think about If you think that. about Western, you think about and those, Clint those Eastwood are, and John Wayne. Those are in their own way. They are pulp. They're pulp Westerns. They're not pulp noir detective novels. But, right. you know, this is... Everything in this movie, it, it plays more like Dick Tracy than it plays like... It's very... Right, and that's what and, I'm saying. And, I love yeah. it for that. And Dick Tracy, Dick Tracy plays homage to Pulp very well because it started as actual Pulp and just continued. Right, it helps. It, that that ground thing in Pulp yeah, makes it. Flow I think. Better. I think what you're getting at, there's a certain uh, dishonesty in in homage. Yes. Yes. And going going for the real thing makes it makes it a lot better. Right. Like, you, and I think with homage, you can do it in a way that feels as good as the real thing. But yeah. It requires you not to say, look, Ma, I'm making an homage Well, yeah. to this thing I think is cool. I you mean... You have to say, I'm going to make a pulp film, and yeah. then just do it. Star Wars and, and Indiana Jones are homages oh, to, yes. to things, but they, they, they stand on their own merits because they're not, oh, this is an homage. Right, nobody, no, yeah, nobody says, like, but, like, Again, this is a thing I kind of have a problem with Quentin Tarantino films, especially. Yeah. But, like, saying this is going to be an homage to this thing I love. Yeah. Makes it not as good. Yeah. Like, oh, like, what? Yeah, I mean, talking about Star Wars and uh, Indiana Jones, some of my, my two f- favorite film series, is, and they are totally pulpy. Yeah. And and it's pulpy. But they're not, under- going, they're not saying, look, Ma, we're going to be pulpy. Understanding them as homage adds another layer to what is already a good movie. Right, exactly. Um, with with Tarantino, and I, I don't really like Tarantino, and maybe this will... This will this I will, like some of his films. It's yeah. up in the air. But um, going into that, the first layer is homage. Right, that's the thing. Is you need to yeah. build a really solid yeah. film first, and then like have the subtleties be homage. And yeah, no, it's just like having watched more homage pulp films than I've actually watched actual, real pulp yeah. films. I realized, wow, this is way better, way more enjoyable. Yeah, no, this is this is a highly enjoyable movie, um, <laughs> to the point where where I kind of just want to say watch it. <laughs> yeah, I do too, and I kind of also wonder if because of the experience we had like right before this film. <laughs> If maybe that makes this film so much better than it actually is. I wonder if there's somebody in the Criterion Collection Library like being very strategic about how they like arrange the films. Like, you know what we'll do? We'll make these American pulp films seem even better by putting the worst film ever made in front of them. <laughs> yes. yes. I mean, it's hard to tell because like literally I watch them within 24 hours of each other. Yeah. Because uh, that's how I always end up watching the films that we do for these recordings. And... You know, I watched a terrible film that shall remain nameless. Um, and then I watched this, and this was just so light and easy to watch and yeah. enjoyable. And I mean, it had its moments that were a little annoying. Like, I found Griff a little hard to deal with at times. Because, like, and I think it's just the misogynistic nature of the character. And I yeah. understand that's a part of, of especially yeah. this sort of noir detective pulp. Yeah. At the same time. It was almost too much because, especially when you consider like the time period that the actual film was made, yeah, it, it's a little bit overly much. I think it's 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 interesting. Um, I think one of my problems wasn't necessarily you know, it's similar. Um, I think Grant's set up as just this perfect guy, yeah, doesn't because he's so forgiving, he's so perfect, he's. Oh, he knows she's a prostitute, but that's fine. And Grant does it to set up a downfall. 
Right. Griff Griff is so quintessentially what he is, and it doesn't. He's wrong at the end, and he's accept, uh, accepting that he's wrong. But it's not it's not a downfall of his wrong. He'll still be Griff. He'll right. Just be, yeah. He'll Griff just be Griff who was wrong that once. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a problem. Yeah, I would have liked Griff to be like have go through some self actualization. That would have been fun. Yeah. Um, I would have also liked Griff to kind of be like the detective with a heart of gold, also. Yeah. Because I don't dislike the actor, but so I kind of felt myself going like, "Ooh, can you just stop being just an actual jerk?" <laughs> And turn out to be like, I'm hard boiled because of these things that happened back in. Well, I yeah. want to say Nam, but we'll say Korea. Yes. And <laughs> back in Nam, that happened in six years. Yeah, right. But you, you know what I mean. Like you want that to happen, but that doesn't happen. That's one of the few letdowns in the film. Is like we even finish because like what you really want with these stories. Because this is such a trope, right? Yeah. She falls for a Grant, who actually turns out to be the crazy pedophile and she turns out to have a heart of gold and then it turns out at the end that griff also has a heart of gold and then they kind of fall in love a little bit or something right yeah they even sort of though she still heads off but yeah yeah, they sort of build up that sexual tension there but that doesn't really pay off at the end the way you would have wanted it to yeah you know what i mean we don't get that like yeah Yeah. you still want her to head off but like you want her to kind of be and that's that's exactly a little teary-eyed but we don't get that really we just get like well, I was wrong. I'm going to go back to being a misogynistic jerk and telling every girl gets off the bus to go to the whorehouse. She still owes me ten bucks. Yeah, and I think that was supposed to be that kind of... I don't know. It's yeah. Griff is a little bit of a letdown. The story, the movie is not a letdown. And I guess in the end, like, Kelly is the main character, and so we're supposed to be primarily concerned about yeah. Yeah. what happens to her. And her story comes off great for her. Yeah. But... With with one exception, I think the completely gratuitous and out of nowhere uh, singing number in the middle. Yeah, right. In the middle of the Where movie. did that come from? <laughs> that I, was I, a little I, bit odd. And and it's it's only meant so that we can have even slightly more horror about what's going on when the same song is being played on the reel to reel in recording in Grant's of house. That performance, yeah. A recording of that specific performance is being is being played. Which I would like to point out makes Grant jump from like pedophile to the creepiest pedophile ever. Yes. Because, yes, because that's such a weird song to be playing while you're molesting children. Like, yes. I, I mean, there's no good song for molesting children, obviously, right? <laughs> but I think we but can like, find better ones. <laughs> right. Like, it's really upsetting. I like, because, like... Because this, yeah, this the song's like, is... why are you crying, mother? Why are you yeah, crying? Yeah, right. And it's, it's some really my crippled children. Thing. The most diverse group of crippled children I've ever seen. Which I think, if, if anything we can draw from this movie, is that if you really aspire... Anyone, no matter what their background, can be crippled. Can be crippled. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, no, it's it, that was really unsettling. That like <laughs> that part, I was like, really, like I know your goal in this film is to make us really think Grant is like a total creep, as like, and really, but that was and, like and, more you know, than it, we needed. It even it even sells Kelly as being great with children and this really good person at her heart. More than we need to be sold on. I mean, we've all, right. we, we already know already she's great. Accepted it, yeah, yeah. Although it's kind of funny because, like, really, that was probably the one <laughs> weak point of the actress. She's actually not very good with children. In like the <laughs> scenes where she's interacting with the children, yeah, it's also a this... very informed informed ability. The way like, she's really yeah, cold, yeah, like just the first time to... we see her interacting. Yeah, she's with, with the, the kids, she's like bend over, and like yeah. I expect her to slap the child. <laughs> like yeah. the nurse, I mean, the nurse it's, is it's, like. Yeah. I think it's established that she's like messing around with him, mm-hmm. but at the same time, but at the same time, it doesn't quite come off that way. It doesn't yeah. quite come off that way. Yeah. So the nurse is like, she's she's just. I've never met anybody with such a natural ability. And then we cut to Kelly and it's like, <laughs> bend the fuck over, kid, or I will slap the hell out of you. It's what it feels what? like she's doing, and it's like, well, that's huh, that's being good Kelly's with children with kids, in 1964. Huh? You see, right? So we kind of wonder: is she great with children in the modern sense of great with children, or is she great with children in the ruler plus headmaster sense? <laughs> yes, yes, cracking knuckles. But oh. no, yeah, like I I understand we're just supposed to take it we're just supposed to accept it but yeah that's the one failing of the actress is like you kind of almost get the impression that the actress doesn't like children 
That's how I felt. I was like, yeah, she really <laughs> no, just I think doesn't like kids. I think you might be right. I think you might be right. They're like <laughs> She's like, after she got signed up for the movie, she's like, wait, I have to work with kids? Ooh, that's going to be a problem. Can you find some short people? <laughs> just like midgets. Yeah, right. Well, like we'll have the kids people? be crippled. Is it okay if the kids aren't... Actually, if we've already children. punished the kids? Yeah. Well, I guess... <laughs> right. Maybe they're crippled because of the punishments. What do you think of that? Maybe just maybe she crippled here. all of the children. In the <laughs> right, right. It's a hospital for crippled children. They don't come in <laughs> crippled. They're like, I just oh. came in because I have a fever, and now I have no legs. A hospital that manufactures crippled children. <laughs> well, you know, the, the term crippled, or like, what was it? Rehabilitation hospital is not yeah. really very specific in its mandate there. I'm actually, I'm really unclear on what they did for the little boy... Uh, Kip, I think, is his name. I the think one, they the one with... his legs. <laughs> That's I don't think Sam Fuller has a really strong grasp of medicine. It's also <laughs> demonstrated in the next film we're going to watch in uh, it's basically It's basically explicitly stated by her that Your every couple legs. of years comes in, he gets new legs. Yeah, I don't right? know what that means. I think they're talking about <laughs> polio... Um, Braces? Like like new braces, and that'd be yeah. understandable, because, and I think you know, he grows, he needs new braces. Short, but the, right, I think yeah. they're just using legs as a shorthand, and maybe we're missing context. Maybe when polio was still a thing, they would just, to be nice to the kids, call him his new legs, and say, like, here's your new metallic, monstrous splint things that will keep you from falling <laughs> over, crippled child. Here's your um, new legs, kid. Yeah, just make it a little bit nicer. So yeah. I think that's a possibility. But yeah, it does sound like every couple of years he goes in and gets leg, like, <laughs> add a leg to me surgery or something like that. It's like, huh? well, he gets the old ones amputated and right. the new, ones, new ones grafted on. They go rob a grave. <laughs> this is an incredibly horrific hospital. <laughs> right. Well, we kind of get some impressions of that. And like I said, we'll see this a lot in the next film. Yeah, yeah. Shot corridor. Definitely. Like, Sam Fuller is not. Do not believe he had what is typically called a medical consultant on staff. <laughs> no, probably not. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right, it's Kip. Maybe it's not, but, yeah, he yeah. gets new legs every couple of years. Which, yes. when you think about it, this is the greatest rehabilitation hospital ever. <laughs> they can do, they can do education leg, followed leg by, transplants. Like, transplants that go off without a hitch. No yes. rejection. Yes. And the child is doing, like, sit-ups within, like, apparently a couple days. Yes. Pretty amazing. Yes. It is. It's absolutely amazing. So really, really, despite Grant's shortcomings as a pedophile, I kind of think his po- his contributions to the world were posi- still possibly well, a positive gain. For you know, he, he he hired good doctors. He yes. hired... Ex- he No, he didn't his... hire good doctors. He hired Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs> Perhaps. Okay? Perhaps, perhaps. Because uh, the, the child has new legs, Adam. It's true. It's true. Anyway, uh, back to the song real quick. Um, not only was that whole scene just out of nowhere and really weird, uh, I can't imagine a hospital choosing to have their children sing such a dirgy, why, why? Yes. Why, why is everything so bad song? Yeah, for, for the rehabilitation festival. <laughs> yes. Yes. Why, mother, do you cry or whatever? I, I forget the words, but yeah, it's yeah, like it's essential. What? That's the refrain. <laughs> yeah, but no, yeah, it's, it's so... it, it's all because they need to be able to play that recording at the end or yeah. at that at that reveal, and so they're like, but it could have been anything, really, because yeah. it would have been equally creepy, I guess, if it had been like, yeah, you know, if like, he's listening, no matter what, Kisara if he's listening, like he's listening, he's listening to other children sing while he molests one a child. Other, yeah. a child. That is, it's, it's that unsettling is, in its nature. That is, it doesn't. That is Buffalo Bill level creepy. <laughs> that is. Uh, anyway, sorry to reference uh, a movie you hate so much. <laughs> I, again, I, I said in the previous. Movie, I do not agree with the critical acclaim, but I do not hate the film. Uh, like, I actually kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> I just would never, ever call it a masterpiece, as yeah. I hear it called so often. This, on the other I love, hand, I would call a masterpiece of pulp. I, uh, one one thing, and it, it, it plays to the pulpiness of this movie, I love that everyone in town calls Grant Grant. Not Mr. Grant. Yeah, not, right. Not whatever Grant's first name is. Yeah, because Grant has no first name. I think that's a shortcoming of a writer, actually. 
I yeah. Where he's like, crap, and, first name? Ugh. And the same thing for Griff. We do, we we get, she asks Griff for her first name, and I think he says it's like Frank or something, if he responds yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, 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 He does, he um, messes but around. But still, everybody, him, everybody everybody's Griff. And, and the kids call them Uncle Grant and Uncle Griff, and it's just... Well, there's only two adult men in town. Yeah, essentially. I mean, at the end, so at the end we kind of see a familiar. few more yeah. uh, in the crowd. But even so, the gathered people, what is, what is implied to be like the whole town exonerating her, uh, gathered outside is still only people. like 20 people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not, I mean, budgetary concerns, I guess, but there's not even enough people to fill all of the houses on Main Street. <laughs> right. Let alone. There's not even enough, yeah, like literally this is a, I think Grant literally, you know what I think this is? I think this is sort of like, um, shoot, what am I thinking of? I, I can't think of uh, the example but that I'm trying to pull, but this is sort of a... I think Grant is literally paid to make this town exist at any given time. <laughs> maybe. Like, maybe. he's importing people. Like, it's a... it's a, <laughs> Like, one of those towns you re- read about on blogs in China where, like, the government is literally paying to make this thing exist. Like, maybe. it's just a... It's a con- like, Grant's pocketbook is so deep and his lack of understanding of humanity so also so deep that he just makes this town exist with with payments to everybody. Maybe which really well, when I you think, think about it means that they shouldn't be celebrating Kelly at all. Yeah, they shouldn't they should well one she's jail. just she's eliminated their their pay horse but two it means that they know what's going on yeah. and they're just being being kept quiet. Um oh my gosh, this movie's so much deeper if it's that way. Oh, it just got so dark. Yeah, it did. Also, the ending doesn't make sense, but um, yeah. okay. Factually, within the movie, we can't support that reading. No, so, um, darn! It's, it's thank a... you for thank you for disproving my idea that you can read anything into anything. Um, but uh, but other if we than worked that, hard enough, maybe we could still make it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe um, they're not going to put Grant in jail. Maybe he's going to get out as soon as Kelly gets on the bus. So they're all putting on a. Well, he's not going show. to jail. He's dead. Oh right! I don't think he's dead. <laughs> No, no, they say he's dead. I know, I know they say he's dead, but again, Oh, you don't, th- you think it's, you think Grant's faking his death? Yes, I think so. Well, especially since what she hit him with, like her, sh- the phone? Yeah, no, she Come hits him on. over the head with the phone. Who is she? Frickin' the Hulk? Now, you'll have to remember that this is in 1964. It's all telephone. Bakelite, which weighs 800 it's... pounds. So <laughs> yeah, everybody, who, exactly. everybody, who, everybody who lifts up a phone <laughs> in the 60s is <laughs> super doing, strong. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Like, there's a reason why children weren't allowed to use phones back then. <laughs> And it had nothing yeah, they, to do they, with, like, they'd have been crushed. or etiquette. They, they would literally, like, probably have to go to the... Well, that's actually how the kids get in the rehabilitation hospital. Yeah. Attempting it's, to it's all children who It's all children who have lifted a phone and their knees just crushed. <laughs> all the cartilage squeezed out. Or, or the phone um, fell over on top of them, off the table. Yeah. Which is, you know, by the way, Mom Bell, one of Ma Bell was one of the, uh, one of the greatest uh, horrors of... Of early American, uh, early twentieth century America, I think, um, <laughs> killing everyone really. Yeah, right. It's I mean, it's a wonder that there's even an America after that. Yeah. No, actually, uh, on that note uh, of, of whether or not he's dead, I think the the reveal because we don't when she she hits him over the head and we just kind of stop that scene. Yeah. And she packs and then, up her belongings and yeah. The next thing we see, um. Yeah, she packs up everything. She sits down, as as that song still plays, echoing through the house. Hooray! Um, oh, it's a creepy scene, though. And then, like the next thing we see is is her landlord, uh, Madame Josephine, um, picking up picking up the newspaper, which in in huge print says, "Grant <laughs> yeah, is right. dead, slain <laughs> by prostitute." Yeah, yeah. But even better is like the the overlay that he throws up when it's a like, Grant. <laughs> Next person is. Is. Next person is. Dead. dead. Yeah. I felt like it's like, are you ready to rock and roll? Or something like that. I was like, what? Yes. That was a bit, that was a bit weird. I, I was waiting yeah. for the spinning newspaper though. That would have been even better. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, no, okay. no, I, absolutely. Absolutely. I no, was it's waiting been... for that. I was like, oh, that, that is, so that is one pulp. One pulp trope we do not. And I'm do not so get sad in this that movie. it's not in there. It's the spinning newspaper. Well, it's far too serious of a scene for it to be a spinning newspaper. There yeah, we are. But okay, so yeah, we. I. What I'm saying is, is uh, <laughs> your argument that literary criticism could prove anything to be true. 
I think we can yeah. still argue those people are being paid off. The, everybody's being paid off. It's not yeah. that hard of an... I mean, come on, conspiracy theorists do it all the time. <laughs> Everybody in that town is being paid off to pretend Grant is dead so that they can get rid of this troublemaker. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it's all a joke on her. Yeah, um, pretty much. They're just trying to her. Force, railroad her out of town. And, yeah. it was, and she's such a troublemaker, it was easier just to pretend he's dead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there we yeah. go. You gotta get they get rid of the troublesome woman, and uh, she can go. She can go cause her trouble and murder some other philanthropist. And they're all secretly robots. Um, probably, probably they're all robots Ooh, too. Maybe, yeah, maybe they're all animatronic. That'd be awesome. I just turned this into a totally different film, didn't I? Oops. Yeah, and and one that I don't like as much. No, uh-huh. I don't either. But I'm just having fun now at this point. No, um, I know. yeah. The point is, is that no, yeah, the film is great. <laughs> And, like, you don't need any of this extra deeper crap <laughs> to make it a great film. No, no. This quote and there's a lot of... Crap. I, love, I love all the all the little characters in this movie. Like, the, the prostitute, whose name is, like, Hat Rack. <laughs> yeah, right, every, right, right. Everybody yeah. wants to hang their fedora on her. And and the nurse, the nurse who considers becoming a prostitute's name is Buff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my favorite, though, honestly, my one of my favorite characters in the film, we don't spend a lot of time with her, is the landlady and her... Her dead fiance, like, yeah, mannequin. I'm like, oh, she's adorable. <laughs> she she is adorable. Uh, she's such an adorable old lady, but and, also and... a total nut job when you think about it. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and that's know, what makes it's, her so much more adorable. It's very subtly played. I mean, we're not. Yeah, she's obviously very much a nut job, and to the point where I almost kind of expected her to kill somebody. Yeah, me too. Story. I was kind of waiting for her to be the bad guy. <laughs> For a little bit. And I was like, no, she's just a crazy person that they just, like, totally steamrolled over and just said, nah, she's yeah. just a crazy lady. Yeah. And she makes the dress and sends Kelly off to see her fiancé. We say, it's bad luck to show him, foreshadowing Ooh, directly. So, yeah, yeah. You know, I thought about that when I watched it, and I was like, especially after I saw the scene, I was like, yeah. are we trying to imply in this film that it's actually Kelly's fault that he's a pedophile? <laughs> see, if she had never caught him... Uh, he well, wouldn't be a bad guy. Yeah, I guess that's... I, I meant more in the sense that he wasn't even a pedophile no, until exactly. she decided to go and see him, and then he just was yeah. magically transformed in this, into a pedophile. There is a, there is a universe where she didn't go to see and him totally and show him the dress, and he's not a pedophile. He's just a really <laughs> nice, a little bit arrogant was, rich guy. Yeah, that's the... Uh, that's the butterfly in Thailand in this movie. <laughs> yeah, right? It's, it's so, her deciding... <laughs> Oh man, okay. it's a totally another movie that would also be really fun to watch. <laughs> um, so here's one thing I didn't, not sure how I felt about was the delivery of the I'm a total, I'm I'm a, like the I'm a pedophile scene. His yeah. confession. Now you know why I could never marry a normal woman. That was a bit weird. That's why I love you. You understand my sickness. That's... You live in my world, and it will be an exciting world. Yeah, Our marriage a... will be yeah. a paradise because we're both abnormal. Yeah, I found that a bit weird. That one was one of the few scenes in the film where I was like, "This is a bit of a hump to get over here." Yeah, there's there's we there's a level really between you understand me because you're a prostitute and you understand. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's one one that's a big jump on Grant's end. Uh, as far as as far as comparative, uh, right? Prostitutes uh, equal people who are totally fine yeah, with pedophilia. Where, apparently, yeah. In Grant's world, all sex crimes are the same sex crime. Which, my, I mean, in one way, it's indicative of just how far gone Grant is in his in his justification of what he's doing. Yeah. But but at the same time, he he's obviously ashamed of it because he's never pursued another woman uh, until he finds a woman he thinks can understand him. Uh, even though that's completely erroneous, even if she, even if she hadn't been trying to turn her life around, no, no, um, there's no, I, I, there's yeah, no, the, the, there's uh, no conceivable, like, like Grant, Grant, and Grant couldn't have gone over to Candy's place and told Candy what was going on and been all, and she would, she'd be all hunky dory with it. That's yeah, not, exactly the 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 idea that like she's a former prostitute who totally revealed all to me equals she will be totally cool with me touching kids for the rest of the time that we are married. Like, yeah. is it really... Yeah, that's one of the few leaps in the film where you're like, oh, this is a bit tough, guys. Um, yeah. Could we have written a better justification? Just a little bit? Yeah. Like, I, but I can't even we don't think need of one, but... It's too pulpy. We don't need that better justification. Yeah, that's true. Well, and like... But it's also kind of wasn't a necessary one. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, we do this whole, like, 
he delivers, he basically delivers this monologue to the camera because yeah. of the first person view, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's weird because it's like we didn't really need to know that. We didn't need him to tell us why he thought she would be okay. You know yeah. what I mean? Like because like And really the weird part is that his monologue sets it up like he expected her to show up. Like, he wanted right, her to walk right, like, in on him at this point. Look at point. the surprise I made for you, darling. <laughs> yeah, and that... And that then, like, some just... balloons, like, fall down from the ceiling, and, like, there's some party <laughs> poppers. Surprise! <laughs> but... If we had cut to downtown at that moment, the uh, the banner across the square would have said, Hey, I'm a, I'm a pedophile. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's... <laughs> It's a weird... That is one of the one parts of the film where it wasn't necessary and it was a little bit weird. And then he sort of kind of... Yeah. Come, like, he could have delivered a speech and it would have been okay, but the fact that he, like, expected her to understand... Yeah. Is a really That's weird just... thing for him to say. Like, he could have, like, broken down or... Like, Even with the implication her. of this being a whirlwind romance and they not knowing each other's, you know, everything... Because uh, obviously she doesn't know his everything until this moment. Right. Um, it's still nothing she has done up until that point Indicates should she's suggest totally cool with this. Yeah, that, that she'd be cool with this. Well, um, and, and yeah, it's just it's it is a bit weird. That part is a bit weird because also he is pursuing her prior to finding out from her that she's a prostitute. Yeah. So yeah. we're kind of in a situation where like. He could have just, like, we could have just left it where he was so overwhelmed by this woman that he felt he needed to pursue her, even though yeah. he has this secret shame. And we didn't really need to get into, like, I thought you would understand. Look at my crazy yeah. eyes. Hit me over the head with that gigantic Bakelite phone. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe it was maybe suicide awesome. by proxy. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a really weird <laughs> fetish. <laughs> oh no! Make a light phone we, head, uh, or phone head hitting. Around. We have been so tainted by watching. Yeah, I know everything in That's every it. movie from now on will be a weird fetish. Okay, okay, but, but the but point is, is, yeah, I find that one scene a little bit off-putting, but otherwise, I love the film. So, yeah, no, no, that certainly true. There was there was one visual thing that I found weird, but still, um. Yeah, and when they're uh, when they're watching the uh, the film he shot on the gondola <laughs> yeah, in Venice, yeah. and and we get this sort of slow fade between them on the couch and them in the gondola in the same position and back and forth and back and forth, but uh, and that's that's fine because it's this dream thing. Yeah, but in kind of both instances, that. in both instances, there's like leaves falling on them, and that doesn't make sense for either area. Yeah. Again, I think also there's this thing in, you know, just like the medical advisors. <laughs> there might be advisors that would tell Sam Fuller that there are no trees in Venice. Or something yeah. like that. At least not, not above not the, the canal. Yeah, okay, there are trees in Venice, but not, yeah, not there. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, maybe like, you know, again, pulp. Yeah. No, I like the fact that it's we can excusable. basically just it's use excusable. the word pulp as a justification for almost everything that happens in this film. Yeah, it's it's there's a lot there's a lot to be excused because of the nature of the film, and and there's nothing wrong with yeah, that. Yeah, we're um, gonna we're gonna go out on a limb and say Sam Fuller not does not have a huge research staff. No, probably not. But or did not. Sorry, he's no longer with why us. Why should he? Why should he? Well, right, exactly. Like who's judging? I oh, mean, there's one. There's one know. more little incongruity. Um, Griff at the end when Kelly's case has been dismissed instead of just like saying oh your case has been dismissed he reads the oh, penal code right, definition weird. of a dismissed case that would be a bit odd. <laughs> I feel like maybe Griff is studying to take the bar exam and we don't know that about maybe it. like, that's maybe, yes, cut out. maybe that's maybe maybe that that would make sense yeah that was a weird thing because it's also like the definition of a dismissal does not actually clearly indicate that it was dismissed and why. You yeah, I mean? like, exactly. I think somehow, like, maybe Sam, I'm going to call him Sam, okay. thought that 
Like maybe didn't really do a lot of proofreading. <laughs> maybe. And thought maybe the you know, or maybe the writer thought that like the definition of a dismissal would clearly indicate the reasons for dismissal. Yeah. And didn't actually double check. Yeah, I mean, we still just have the word of a clearly, and there's no like chain of evidence here. Like, oh, no. like well, this is Kelly does the inter- okay. Kelly does the interview with uh, with the with the little girl, right? Which is like, absurd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and but we do it fair, so that Griff can say the Child and Protective Services Department is is owned by Grant. So yeah, there's no, yeah, no legitimate way to have a fair trial in this in this town. Yeah. I, I, we get it. We get it so that Griff can kind of try to humanize her a little bit more and say, "Don't, don't talk to her as Kelly. Talk to her as a mother." And and at the same time, that kind of, I don't know. It it tries one more time to push Kelly back into this stereotypical woman position. Yeah, which is weird because this film does not paint her in that yeah. light at all. And I yeah, love and she's the way not it supposed to her. And then every so often they're like, "You're a woman. Gosh darn it, act like one." It's a very empower, empowering movie for her. Uh, even within, I mean, obviously she works as a nurse. She she does very stereotypical. She, female she's jobs. still in very very stereotypical, stereotypical and nurse. female place, but but she does it. It's it's her self defining her life, right. and that's that's where this is good uh, from a from a you know from a feminist standpoint. Yeah, and I, it does uh, have some really it has some very good feminist leanings in the film that are actually come off quite yeah. well. Except for every so often yeah, and just like, be a woman, gosh darn it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that doesn't... It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't yeah. play well because because Kelly accepts it rather than being like... Yeah, and, and even Kelly still has some problems because, you know, she says something about, you know, a woman searching for happiness. As a woman, we're always looking for happiness and why can't I make that dream come true? Yeah, there's a few moments. Uh, in... In talking about marrying Grant mm-hmm. before she finds out about Grant, so you know but it's again it's, the writer uh, was probably a man, so this is probably his best shot. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, Samuel Fuller wrote this too. Oh, okay, so well, there you was, go. Yeah, exactly. He did his best. Okay, he did his best. Certainly not had. nearly as misogynistic as the next film. No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Wherein the same actress is completely uh, not the same character. Yeah. No, nothing, no, nothing no. similar about the two. But no, I'm sorry, I digress. But yeah, basically, we will we will get into that. Well, actually, I think we could probably wrap this one up and just. Yeah, I think we should wrap that up and slide into uh, Sam Fuller's previous film than this, though the next one in the Criterion Collection. I hate Join us next time on Lost of Criterion. This. Yeah, it's weird. Join us next time on Lost of Criterion for Shock Corridor. And we'll, say we'll, uh, shock we'll see you then. Corridor. Yes, Shock Corridor. There you go. Okay, bye. Talk to you next time. Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com 
or join us on the web at www.